All right, guys, special episode. This is our first guest. Now, for all the people that say this show is very biased and we have an agenda and all that, you're sure to enjoy this one. We have an expert on Congress. Her name is Jennifer Briney, and uh, she's about to school us on the inner workings of these 5,000 page bills that go through Congress and how laws get made. Yeah, and it's funny because this is the first one that's that big. Like, I think she said it was probably like five or six years ago since one of them was even half this size. Yeah. So she'll, mm-hmm. she'll be doing that for for a hot minute before she actually finishes it and puts it up as a podcast. But what'd you think of the episode? What'd you think about just listening to somebody who knows that type of material Man, so deeply? I think it's super cool that somebody decided to nerd out just on this branch of government, like all Congress, and which is, you know, an institution that has very low approval rating and they have a lot of power and control over our daily lives, whether like wars get funded, do people get stimulus checks? Where's my stimmy? Where's the stimmy? But um, I think it's fascinating. I, I actually would love to see more like short clips from her of her like dropping knowledge about the subject. And I think it'd be cool if we like, Find a way to all hang out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because I, I, I just, I appreciate people that nerd out about stuff. And I think it's a subject that's overlooked, like all this inner workings of Congress and government. Um, I mean, don't get me wrong. Like in high school, that didn't sound like a subject I'm going to be psyched about. Not like at all. U.S. government. Oh, hell no. Nah. But uh, I had fun. Uh, she's not a Trumper at all. She voted for Biden. Uh, she backs up her reasons. Um, and just like everybody else, man, we're just trying to pick the lesser of two evils. Yeah, and then she voted independent, which you'll hear about in 2016. And uh, we were we did it via Zoom, so the lag might be there. This one's going up on YouTube. It's not the Patreon exclusive, so mm. if you, you watch it, that's that's why we're still dealing with the Wi-Fi. Our patrons are helping us get hardwired. Damn it, <laughs> hardwired internet back here. I was gonna blame it on Zoom. I was gonna be like, man, it's China, bro. We're dropping too much knowledge. That's actually a good point. That might be the total uh, China Communist Party sabotage. CCP, sabotage. But um, yeah, man. Was there anything that you wanted or that you were keeping up with lately? This is kind of like we're putting it as the beginning of the podcast. So we're letting you guys know what we did and talk to or whatever. But our next episode is uh, the Patreon exclusive. So you got any, how much time you got? You got anywhere to be after this? Uh, I know um, Marisol is recording she has, after yeah, this. I, I don't know what time because she didn't tell me exactly. Well, we covered a lot of the stuff uh, in this episode. For example, how things are miraculously opening up. Yeah. Like I'm talking to Marisol, uh, my wife, about like, hey, are they going to shut it back down? Is this variant, you know, whether this the South Africa, the UK, whatever other variant, you know, is everything going to stay open? Because we didn't get to tour much at all in 2020. And um, hey, it's a Biden miracle. I'll take it. I'm not mad at, at Joe B if he's going to be our white savior <laughs> and, uh, you know, get these vaccines out and f- figure it out. I don't know. But I heard Chicago's opening up, D.C., Michigan, California miraculously, I think, is opening up. This Friday. Man, I can't wait. Please, please do. Or at least LA County, LA County this Friday, and then she said that most places are already kind of opened up in as a, of today. Open up in a safe way, because I don't want people to misinterpret my enthusiasm to an open economy to, you don't care about grandma, and it's going to hit close to home once you realize Corona's real, crazy Trumper. That's uh, not what I'm saying. There's that that super, super right-wing uh, journalist, real pretty white chick, Tommy Lauren, or Tommy mm-hmm, Lauren, mm-hmm. where she always wears that gear where it's like, if you're scared, stay home. And that's kind of been my philosophy the entire time, right? Like, if you are scared, you should stay home. And we should encourage people that are, you know, immunocompromised or just frightened of what could be to stay home and let everyone else kind of go about their life. Well, it was weird because it was election time. So in the middle of all the mudslinging, and the, uh, the media and the, the propaganda and trying to blame everything on Trump. It was just kind of hard. Because I ain't going to lie, we were scared of shit like in the beginning. It yeah. was like, oh man, ain't no, you know, what's going on? We got to get water, Purell, ain't no Purell. They ran out of Lysol. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. We were all that way for sure. Because yeah, nobody knew what was going on right when it first kicked off. Man, you know how they promote and wearing three masks, five masks now? That was me in the beginning. Like, I'd had to go to the grocery store with the rubber gloves and everything. And Yeah, I had some stuff. Uh, I was storing some stuff for Chingo props or something uh, months and months ago. When this first started last year, and Chingo came to pick them up from my place. Mm-hmm. And, you we know, shook. Ma- mask on and elbow. And again, like, I kept the distance, you know. I was just like, all right. at the, already at the time, I was also like, we should be careful. But also, I didn't expect that the Miley King to show up so prepared to socially distance and yes i think he was spraying as he was driving off so that the air behind him also had hand sanitizer i was like all right man see you later it's an animated gif right here (laughs) you do do that a lot like it's fucking cold back here 
Oh, yeah? You know, little cumbia sounds. People need to follow your TikTok if they're not following it, man. Please do. Got some and, uh, hilarious shit up there. And we have some tour dates coming up. Freedom of Speech Tour. We hit Naples, Florida, Off the Hook Comedy Club, February 10th. Shout out to Governor DeSantis. And then February 11th, we head over to West Palm Beach Improv. Shout out to Mar-a-Lago. We're going to be out there. Before I believe it. Yeah, we're going to be out there at the new uh, office of the former president, <laughs> Donald Trump. Trump a fool with it. That shit's not even real. Life's not even real at that point. Uh, so on that note, um, this is our free episode. It's going to be up on YouTube. We have some special stuff coming up for Patreon exclusives, uh, more Patreon content. So if you want to hop on there, it's patreon.com forward slash red pill tamales. Mm-hmm. And we're still waiting on our stimmy. So Biden, <laughs> I know you're busy with all your stuff. And I heard they're going to give los papeles to um, all my raza, uh, like 11 million, supposedly. Um, I heard they're going to put Harriet Tubman on the $20 bill, but they ain't got time to work on the STEMI. Um, people voted against, or I guess, you know, I guess uh, the black community overall voted against the platinum plan, which was half a trillion dollars. But don't worry, because Biden is putting Harriet Tubman uh, uh, on the 20. He's taking, who is that, Andrew Jackson? Yeah, I did see that. Taking Andrew Jackson off. So our money is going to look a little different uh so i don't know i don't know if we're going into bitcoin next. it's gonna look a little different and you're also gonna get less of it and you're if in you're in some specific communities isn't that weird less of it what if you i'm saying like if you didn't if you would have gotten the platinum plan oh. you got all the money yeah i mean hey man Lil wayne and ice cube tried to tell y'all but uh you know it's all good um also there's a new travel ban coming from uh, i guess south africa however the media is not covering it as a xenophobic racist african ban so, also, you're allowed to call the, um, check it out, listen to this tweet. Wait a minute. After months of being told it was racist to refer to COVID as a Chinese virus, the, the Washington, what is that? The WP, Washington Post, refers to its new strain as British and South African variants. So, you can use the name of the nation where it comes from, as long as that nation ain't China. Got it. <laughs> Noted. You are on notice. On notice. Yeah, people in New Mexico mad at Biden right now because, breaking news, New Mexico leaders say Biden's domestic energy bans will devastate the state's economy, where jobs, education, and public programs depend on funding from that industry. So uh, Biden won New Mexico 54 to 43. Ain't that a bitch. And we're going to have more of these interesting voices. And we talked about this, like season three, you know, our third dozen is going to have a lot of, a lot more guests, a lot more interesting points of view mm -hmm. on the show. This is, we kind of started early with Jen, but uh, we got some other ones lined up and people are going to, you know, going to have to swallow the pill either you by, by your own choice, or we're just going to have to shove it down your throat because these people are going to be talking about the subjects that you think, or some people think that we just kind of throw out there all yeah. willy nilly. And, and it's cool if you voted for Biden. It's cool if you're Democrat. It's yeah. cool if you like Bernie, AOC. As long as you're cool. Wouldn't you agree? If you voted for them, that's cool. As long as you as a person is cool because <laughs> if you're not cool then it's not cool yeah well you know you know what i'm about man like if you voted for biden and all that that's cool it's just you know just don't be naive when you see everything opening up all of a sudden to me it lets me know that a lot of this was done for political reasons things were shut down to make trump look bad and now things are miraculously opening up however people in my comment section want to look at me like i'm dumb and I'm the crazy one because they're like, ah, Chingo, factor in the vaccines, bro. You know, Biden's fixing everything. Is it really or is it just that the media is in cahoots and you're not really getting real news anymore? It's just this product that's for clicks and, and dollars, advertising dollars. But hey, hey, man, without further ado, you want to go ahead and get into the episode? Yeah, let's yeah. get into it. Yeah, so all the way from... LA. She's based out of LA right now. Did you know her when she was out in Houston? Uh, she was in Dallas, I believe. She was in another state, but she went to Oakland for a hot minute and then uh, LA. Okay. Well, without further ado, the host of Congressional Dish, ladies and gentlemen, Jennifer Briney. Sus. Today we have the host of Congressional Dish podcast, Jennifer Briney. Rob, tell us a little bit more about Jen. Yeah. So Jen, we met probably over 10 years ago on Twitter. 
where the Rogan verse was kind of taken off first. And we had this whole death squad movement that was really being pushed by Joe Rogan and the JRE. And then somewhere in the mix, I met Jen on Twitter and we started podcasting on my original show. And then we ended up just meeting other people through Twitter and talking about Congress and government and politics when we, or I rather, had no business talking about that stuff. But I was so interested in it. And Jen had this really good way of explaining it and breaking things down. I mean, we talked to some people who, like one was a congressional candidate who I don't even think exists online anymore, and I'd rather not even say his name because he went through some crazy rabbit holes uh, about 10 years ago, and I'm sure Jen knows who I'm talking about. I do. I was yeah. just thinking about him. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. But uh, we had some really good conversations, and now we, we started doing this, you and I, and I was like, man, this might be one of the best guests to have on because I talked to you yesterday, and you have no affiliation with any political party. And you just kind of talk shit about everybody, but you also break things down that are happening in Congress. I do. Well, and I started this as just a taxpayer, so it wasn't like I was, I wasn't even looking for a career at the time. I was just losing my mind because I was watching C-SPAN and I knew that they were sneaking things into law. And so I just wanted someone to talk to about it and I figured out how to start a podcast and that's really how it started my whole shtick back in the bad old days was I was going to read every bill that passed the House of Representatives. And I did that for two years until I realized, like, that's how I realized that that's impossible. So um, now I'm picking and choosing what I focus on, but I learned by doing that. Um, I have no affiliations with anyone in Congress. I've actually never stepped foot in the Capitol building, which is funny, the closest I've obviously like been outside like a tourist but um the closest i've been to being an insider in dc is i went on c-span once last summer um other than that i'm just like everybody else i just want to know what the hell they're doing with my money because like we all know that we pay taxes but then we don't know what they do with the cash and i personally feel like i pay way too much money to not know where it's being invested so that's that's why i do what i do i'm just just like everybody else, but nerdier. Well, hopefully we can red pill a bunch of people and get them to subscribe to Congressional Dish <laughs> and listen to you pick apart, you know, the, the, the legislation, stuff that turns into law and stuff, and find the dingleberries, as you would say. <laughs> uh, I don't know if that's another word for pork or, uh, or, or what exactly. What, what, is, what is a dingleberry that you would find in some of this congressional stuff? Well, the official word for that, if you're like reading The Hill or something, is rider, as in like it's stuff that rides into law attached to bigger pieces of legislation. So, for example, every single year we have to fund our government. It's Congress's most basic job. And so that's something, to, regardless of who's in charge of Congress or the presidency, that's a law that has to be signed. And so what people in Congress do is they take something that they want and they attach it to that law and then it hitches its way along with government funding um, to being the law of the land. Like a good example right now is a, the, the new NAFTA treaty. There was no debate on that on the Senate floor. There was no debate on that on the House floor. It just attached itself to the most recent government funding and now it's law. That's not how treaties are supposed to be signed and it's not the first treaty I've seen done this way. But it's stuff like that. It's, it's things that on its own or might just be straight up horrific, but people usually as a corporate favor want it to become law and so they just dingleberry it. It's just like my way of <laughs> being uh, I, not professional. I was, um, that's my, my nickname for it. I was listening to, it was genius by the way, I, I love that because yeah. uh, it, it, it kind of shows how, it kind of simplifies and demystifies this stuff because as you say, you know, we're all taxpayers, but a lot of people have the attitude of, who cares, Chingo? Both sides are corrupt. And it's like, yeah. get over it. Who cares? And who cares? And, uh, you know, I think that's how you end up with a corrupt government like like Mexico's government. Because everybody was on some, who cares? Who cares? Nothing we could do. Our vote don't count. These elections are a sham every year. You know, I'm talking about, you know, people from like Mexico. Because, I mean, that's how my parents, their whole attitude was just kind of like, ah, we just work. Don't get too involved in politics because... You're just wasting your time because... That's still have a lot of people's idea. And eh, I don't want to really worry about it. Yeah, and that makes me insane because, I mean, I work so hard. We all do to make our money. And it's an investment that we make with those taxes, you know? And so these people in government politics is determining how much money goes in your paycheck. It determines, are you going to get health care provided as part of that investment? Or do you going to have to pay for that out of pocket on top of your tax investment? Um, how are you going to get to work today? Are the roads going to be 
safe or do you have a subway system? Do you have a train system? Like it affects our day to day life. Politics isn't just these jerks on the television and their debates because I actually hate politics. I'm fascinated by government and I want to know what government is doing, what laws do am I expected to live by and how are they going to affect me? And um, when you focus on government instead of their debates and their I mean, I think we really confuse what politics is. Like politics is gross to people because it is the, the fighting matches between these two sides that I don't even think are real. Um, but it's it's fighting and it's campaigns and it's the horse race and it's who's raising those money and all that is disgusting to me. Government is different. You know, like um, I learned so much about not only my own country, but the world by watching congressional hearings because these people are under oath. They're not allowed to lie. So um, we get expert testimony that goes on for hours and hours and hours, and I learned so much, and yet these amazing hearings are not even mentioned on the news. Instead, you'll have some idiot congressman that's allowed to just say whatever he wants for three minutes, and we're being, it's a disservice to us. There's fascinating stuff going on every day that the American public just isn't being told, and so that that madness is what drove me to start the show. Um, cause we live in a very fascinating country with an enormous amount of money and power. And I want to know what's happening with that money and power. I was listening to your podcast and you mentioned how, when they were doing the, um, the, I guess it's the, uh, the 5,000 page thing, the AOC said, you know, this is a hostage situation. You right. gave us two hours to read this document over 5,000 pages. Uh, you mentioned that all this negotiation was happening during when they were supposed to be vacationing. So it turned into like a thing where it's like, all right, guys, we need to get this done because it's Christmas break. Like, that's pretty unfortunate, would you say, or, or describe that process? So this actually happens more often than not, at least my experience. I've been doing the show for over eight years. This is my ninth year. And so that's actually a government funding law that you're referring to. Now, in the media, we probably know it better as the COVID relief bill, the one that was signed right around Christmas. It's not a COVID relief bill. That is government funding with COVID relief attached. There is a difference. Um, and that's what made it must sign. So that's why, like, they knew it was basically a dingleberry. <laughs> the COVID relief was a dingleberry on the government funding. And when you look in this law, there's supposed to be 12 different sections of government. All of them are supposed to be funded by September 30th. Didn't happen this year. Um, the House tried. They got 10 out of the 12 done. The Senate did nothing with those bills. So the deadline got kicked into December. And I see this year after year after year where they kick that deadline into December. It always runs right up to the holidays. And these people are so desperate to be done for the year and go home for the holidays and Christmas and New Year's and my kids and all that, that they just pass whatever is given to them. And this year was more egregious than most because we have not only all 12 sections of government funding in there, we have COVID relief, and then there were a whole bunch of other bills that were in there. So I'm, I'm just at the point now where I've looked at the entire table of contents. And I can tell you like the letters, they had to use double letters. So it's like, you know, the first part of government funding is division A, and then it goes B, C, all the way down to, I think the last one is, I don't know. I know that COVID is M and N and they have like double A, double B, double C. Like there's so many bills attached to the end of it. So, and it's that strategy that I just talked about. They knew that this was going to be must sign. It didn't matter what Trump wanted. The repercussions was there was going to be a government shutdown. He had to sign it. So that's why they attached COVID and all this other stuff to it. And the end result is the most offensively long bill that I've ever seen um, it's 5,593 pages. And this is what AOC was talking about. She was given a couple of hours, most of our representatives, a couple of hours to digest what was in that before they were allowed to vote. And that's just, it's offensive. It's not how the system is supposed to work. Um, unfortunately, it's so routine that the people in leadership seem to be okay with it. But you see someone like AOC, who in a lot of ways is like I was in the beginning, coming into Congress and being like, okay, this is how it's supposed to work. This is what the rules say. And then living through like, oh, wait, this is how it's actually done. This is wrong. And so you see this bartender who won, what, two years ago? Yeah. Um, she's mm -hmm. relatively new. And so she's just seeing these processes for the first time herself and going, oh, my God, this is wrong. And so the younger people are offended by it. But right now, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Mitch McConnell, the same people that have been in Congress my entire life, they're still in charge and they're doing this every year. This year's just worse 
than usual. I, just, I saw yesterday. Like, for example. Go ahead. Oh, let me just tell you the difference. Like, because that sounds like a lot of pages. I was offended in 2018 when they did this with a bill that was 2,232 pages. I thought that was bad. And this is more than twice that size. Do you remember what that bill was for? It was government funding. Oh. It was the same exact thing. I was going to say, I, I think yesterday Ted Cruz had tweeted that he had like presented something as far as term limits. Did you Do you remember reading anything about that? I don't pay attention to most of anything <laughs> Ted Cruz says. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no. Callie at heart over here. Oh, you still, hey, Ted Cruz been <laughs> been in a intense Twitter battle, uh, some Twitter beef on them Twitter streets. It was Ted Cruz versus Seth Rogen, the Canadian comedian. No shit. Yes, I didn't see no, this. No, really. Uh, Jen, when it comes to political cheese man, you know gossip. That's more my. You know, I don't read the bills. I don't. I don't go through A B C D. I'm into the Twitter beefs, so um, I highly recommend we can make a drinking game out of it. Uh, we could break it down like a school, uh, what is it, school house rock? Yeah. It? Like, you know, all right, these are the elements of a Twitter beef, you know. <laughs> in my opinion, in my opinion, Seth Rogen, last time I checked, you're Canadian, fool. Yeah. You're Canadian. Number one, this is America. Uh, number two, I don't know what kind of mid-grade Reggie weed Seth Rogen been on, <laughs> but he's obviously not high enough to really peep everything, you know, the nuance. He's not up on game. And then Beto O'Rourke hopped in it. See, this is where it gets good, Jim. Oh. I'm going to give you the play-by-play. Beto O'Rourke. Can you just tell me really quick, what are they talking about? Yeah. So basically, Seth Rogen is accusing Ted Cruz of being like a traitor, treasonous, insurrectionist, insightful, you know, evil, Benedict Arnold type of person. He just came at him like this on Twitter? Um, Somehow, some way. Okay, okay. It was very like... It was very judgy. For somebody that smokes marijuana, it was very judgy mm. on behalf. For the guy that made Pineapple Express. Makes me sad a little bit. Yeah. I was like, bro, you a comedian. You, you're going back and forth with Ted Cruz. And then Beto O'Rourke hopped in them Twitter streets. He went in there, got his phone out. And he was like, Ted just needs to like stop. You know, he's losing very badly. Um, <laughs> you know, this is Seth Rogen we're talking about here. And I'm like, Beto, it's... It, you, you Shut know, your it's, it's like we're on. It's like we're at the lunch table, and, and somebody's getting roasted. They're battling, and here comes Bethel trying to hop in. You know what I mean? That goes back to what Tulsi Gabbard was saying on Rogan about how she. And I've always thought this in my head, and maybe you probably know this more that or imagine that Congress felt like high school. Oh yeah. Yeah. Isn't that you fucking know. sad? Yeah, it's awful. It's it's the most frustrating thing in the world to watch, and I think that's one of the ways I've failed in my show is I really haven't shown that that much. I try to focus on the issues and so when something like the capital storm happens and there's 138 republicans that support you know basically throwing out the votes of millions of people when that happens i think it just kind of surprises my audience and americans because i don't think they realize how extreme and how childish some of the people representing us really are it's it's terrifying and so to hear tulsi like it, it makes me sad too because tulsi gabbard and justin amash are two of my favorite members of congress and they're both gone. They both started around the same time I started to show in 2012. And they just feel like it's so out of control up there. And their their colleagues are so devoted to party and tribalism that they don't feel like they can make that big of a difference in Congress. They feel like they can big, make a bigger difference outside of Congress. And I've never heard anything so <laughs> depressing in my life, you know, that these good people are leaving. Oh, I love Tulsi. Congress yeah. Is so bad. Man, yeah, I love her too. they're lucky Tulsi wasn't uh, the actual nominee. Well, yeah, there's no way they could have let her. What, what's your opinion on that? What? Because I, I want to go back to what's happening like right now with, with everything. But personally, I got to ask you because it's been so long. And I'm sure we, we've, I don't think we've talked about it. Like what exactly was going through the, the left's or the DNC's mind when she basically demolished Kamala Harris on stage? In your opinion. Well, I mean, I don't really know about that. I know the big picture is that the DNC is a corporate it's a part it's a party that is run by corporate dollars that ever since the Clinton years, they've abandoned the idea that they work for the people that they work for workers more specifically. And um, they've been chasing those corporate dollars. Well, Tulsi doesn't accept corporate dollars, so they could never allow her to become their presidential nominee because they would have to turn away all of the money that they've worked for. Like, that's why Nancy Pelosi is speaker. She's an amazing fundraiser. We all know she's not a great speaker. Um, yeah, I feel like her teeth are going to fall out at any moment. I know, right? There's also that. Like, what's going on with those dentures? Um, 
But yeah, she's not an effective legislator. She's not getting things that we want into law, but she's amazing at fundraising. So she's in leadership. Tulsi isn't. And I think it really comes down to that. There's also the wars. Um, the defense industrial complex is just so powerful. You can see it even this year. When you look at the actual funding levels of what happened with COVID and all that, COVID was the least amount of money put into that giant bill. Then it was domestic spending and war is still our number one chunk of money that that we're spending. And so if you look, if you follow the money, Tulsi was going to be very difficult <laughs> as the presidential nominee for the war industry and all of the corporations that are funding the leadership of the Democratic Party's campaigns. Now, the Democratic Party is they're a little different, like all of the Republicans are down with the whole corporate thing. I mean, they don't even hide it that they are there there to represent businesses, to deregulate, which basically means tearing up the rules on behalf of corporations, like they don't even hide it. There are factions of the Democratic Party that are truly trying to work for the workers. They are vastly outnumbered. And so when I say this, I know it's unfair to paint the entire party like this, but when it comes to the leadership, they don't like people like Tulsi. They don't like people like AOC. They sure as hell don't like Bernie because they work for the corporations. And so when we look at like the divide in this country, it's not red versus blue. It really isn't. It's who's working for the corporations and who's working for the workers. And right now, the workers are vastly, vastly outnumbered in Congress. So uh, is it safe to say you're a Tulsi fan? I like her a lot. Uh, yeah, are there... I haven't agreed with everything that she said, but I know that her intentions are where they should be. A any other At folks? least in my opinion as a worker. A and also in your opinion, are there any other, um, I guess, folks that um, you, you're kind of down with or you support? Just so that, you know, our listeners could be like, oh, let me check those people out. Um, well, well, yeah, took a long time. Yeah, she, Jen's like, uh, she's like, all of them dingleberry. <laughs> no, there are. Um, <laughs> well, I've definitely, I've really liked Bernie Sanders for a very, very long time. Um, he actually taught me a lot about how Congress works because every Friday he used to go on Tom Hartman's program and do something called Brunch with Bernie. And for an hour, he would just take any old Yahoo's phone calls and answer our questions. And it was amazing to listen to. So he's always communicated with the public. He's never had any fear of telling us the truth. So I like him. Um, is he still the same? Is, is he still the fan. same Bernie, Jen, that he was 10 years ago? Do you think? Do you think he's still the same Bernie he was 10 years ago? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah. Which is why it was so hard for him to run in the Democratic Party because same problem as Tulsi. He doesn't take corporate funding. He's not going to be pro-war. So they just, if he's not down with that game, he's not going to do well in either of these parties. Um, I, wonder, I mean, pretty much I'm a fan of anyone that's on behalf, who's working on behalf of workers. Um, I do understand that we need to have businesses in this country. I'm not like anti-business, but the pendulum has swung so far in favor of corporate rights that, um, and they have so much power that I'm really... Just a fan that any of anyone that is looking out for us, you know. Um, and I know that I just named <laughs> the two most theoretically lefty people in the universe. Um, but before he left Congress, Justin Amash, he labels himself a libertarian. I was a huge fan of his. He was another one that just was offended by these giant bills, and he would vote his conscience, and he would always tell people how he voted. Just I really appreciated him. Um, well. You were about to say AOC. So what's your your yeah. your thoughts on AOC? Because she gets a lot of shit and says some radical shit online. She does. But what I really like about her is that she is so present online. There's no one else that is speaking to the public the way she is. There's no one else that interacts with us the way that she does. I mean, she skipped the inauguration parties and went to the... There was a picket line for... I can't even remember which union it was, but they were on strike in Brooklyn. And so she went to hand out meals instead of going to the inauguration parties. She, I also know that she's a bartender yeah. that took on one of the most prolific fundraisers, Crowley, in the Democratic Party and took him down. And so from the very beginning, the way she got elected, she didn't just get elected. She took down a fundraising titan, and that's why they hate her. Um, weren't the people behind her though the people behind her pulling the strings as they say it, like kind of responsible for that like the money that were behind her the people that found her essentially were the people that put her in that position to take over does that make sense 
Because yeah. she she just really she she herself got out of the bar, said I want to run for Congress, and started taking down these people. Her opposition is that what I'm hearing? She took down Joe Crawley. He was the one that had represented that district for a very long time, and she primaried him, and she won. That was the scandal. It wasn't necessarily that she won the seat, because after that, it was a shoe in It was a Democratic um, district. But she was one of the people that had the balls to primary a Democrat, and not just any Democrat, a high-ranking Democrat, and win. And so um, leadership of the Democratic Party being very, very corporate and very into raising money, they don't like this girl because she's not taking corporate money. She's actively speaking out. She's so effective in hearings. She's so good. Well, she, like if she, she's sitting there against a CEO, she's going to rip them to pieces. And in a very polite, um, respectful way, she just lines up facts and asks good questions. And like, she is exactly what I want to see in a representative. And she's exactly what the corporations don't want. So yeah, I'm a big fan of her. Even if she says her ideas are somewhat naive, but I've been very naive in my journey with Congress too, thinking that more can be done than well, realistically she, can. So I'm not going to hold that against her. I like that she's dreaming big. I, that yeah. doesn't bother me at all. She, she's definitely a great communicator. She's probably one of like the biggest stars in politics. That's both sides included. For sure. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, the thing about the picket line, I wish they would have promoted that more because instead the headline was, because she's afraid she didn't want to attend because she was afraid uh, to be around Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> that's what we saw in the news. Like maybe that's the right spreading disinformation <laughs> and propaganda. Yeah. And I, I feel for her um, in that because the since the very beginning, the corporatocracy on the right and the left has been gunning for her. I mean, imagine if you're Nancy Pelosi and you've been there for 40 years and you're supposed to be the queen bee of the House of Representatives, and this little you know, bartender rolls in and everybody likes her more. This little spicy like, Latina. Yeah. Like brand new freshman. Who the fuck are you? You know, if you're Nancy Pelosi and her friends. So like I said, if you think about it, like high school, here is this senior Regina George situation. And this freshman is going to come in and like steal her thunder. Like, I don't think so. Especially not one that's not raising money for the party. Like, of course they hate Jen, it. It makes perfect sense. Jen, I have a question. What could we do, all, all three of us included, mm -hmm. to make, um, I guess, understanding government and, and this type of subject like more sexy? Like, in other words, how do we break? Like, in other words, how do we break it down in a in a hip, simple, not not like I, I heard you mention like uh, you know break stuff down like uh, school kid. What is it? School rock. Schoolhouse rock. Yeah, school. like kind of like schoolhouse rock, but in the, because, like for instance, you know, with my background, a lot of my fans used to be hood a lot of them have matured but a lot don't want to grow up and they're the they're more of the um oh who cares you're just crying because trump lost you know, <laughs> yeah you know haha yeah. -ha, conservative tears or whatever <laughs> so like i wonder what we could like how we can do like a joe rogan play by play or i don't know are you doing something like that where you take the five thousand page bill and just like highlight a couple fun dingleberries <laughs> Is there anything like a Trevor Noah show out there for like Congress where people are so excited to hear this fucking guy in the corner of his room talk about nonsense when they could be talking about real stuff? I mean, I'm hoping I'm creating it. But <laughs> You're that I person. My top off. I don't know how to do it sexy. <laughs> hey, Red well, the Malas, we're getting well, somewhere you, now. You know what I mean? What I mean is like people shy away from certain subjects. Well, you know what I mean is like, how do we make it cool and hip and, and one of those things where it's... You know, because when people hear it, it's kind of like, what? You guys are talking about yeah. politics and government and Congress? Like, who does that? I think it's so interesting, right? <laughs> like, we're just trying to make as much, uh, as much as we can make it interesting and informative. And even though people don't agree with us, like, I get it. Like, two Mexican-American Texas boys, basically, trying to talk politics. Talking about propaganda and, and, my, and like, and, persuasion. You know, yeah, and, and mainstream media and, and the psychology of it all. And people just don't want to hear it. the people that don't want to hear it let you know i don't want to hear it like mainstream media is is gospel it's truth it's facts it's news um i'm finding that after growing my audience is that people when they see the subject matter they think it's going to be boring and they don't tune in it's once they hear one full episode then they're hooked it's fine but that initial like oh listen to a podcast about congress they're not interested um, which is why it's so important to me. Like I don't do a lot of marketing, which I'm sure is not good, but, um, I just think it's going to be much more effective for the teenager that's listening to badger that person's friend 
and just be like, no, it's not boring. I swear to God, listen to it. Like you get to hear the clips for yourself. Like I, I'm trying to make it entertaining because I'm so fascinated by it. And I think that's a part of making a good show too. It's like, you have to be fascinated by your topic. You have to be into it in order to tell the stories well. Um, and I think Congress is an intimidating subject, or at least it was for me for sure, because it is such a weird, wonky institution. There's a lot of characters. Like you have to memorize 535. Like I'm sure you heard it in my last episode, but it pisses me off to no end that Josh Hawley, Senator of Missouri, and Ted Cruz, the Senator from Texas, they were the two people that objected in the Senate to certifying the electors. Not a fan of what they did, but there were six people in the House. And one of them was Mo Brooks, who went to the rally and like Yosemite Sam, like rallied the people to go and storm the Capitol. I mean, Trump wasn't nearly as extreme as Mo Brooks was. And yet Mo Brooks, most people still don't know his name. So I get that it's a lot of characters. I get that it takes a minute, but if um, the mainstream media bothered to do it, there's endless stories there. And that's the biggest problem that I have with my show. There are more stories than I can possibly. Are you, are you on TikTok? No, I hate social media, man. I know that I should be doing all that shit, but I just, I do Twitter because that's how I collect information from people. And um, I have an Instagram, but I don't really use it. I, um... Yeah, I'm my own worst enemy when it comes to marketing. Because these days, like my 12 year old, she'll she'll pull out TikTok. She's like, "Dad, is this true?" And she'll just so, show me like, it'll be like uh, the fine people who like Trump told people to drink bleach and all these things. And I'm yeah. like, that didn't happen. He wasn't talking about that. That's lacking yeah. context. So there's like these little 12 year olds that are on TikTok that are finding a way to summarize some of this stuff for kids. But unfortunately. It's steering them in the wrong. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. What do you take that? Shit? But dad, you know, she says that, you know, is that true, daddy? And I'm, I'm like, no, no, mija. You know, we already had, you know what I mean? Operation Warp yeah. Speed. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to be Jen Bryany doing those TikToks. Yeah, it's just, I don't know how we combat this. I really don't. Like someone who's doing great on um, Instagram with excellent, just quick information is um, Erica Mandy. Her show is called The Newsworthy. So her podcast is 10 minutes long every day. She's a friend of mine. She works so hard, um, but she makes it nonpartisan. Like even on our back channel, she won't tell me what she thinks about stuff. Like she's that professional, um, but it's 10 minutes a day. She'll give you the headlines real quick in your Instagram story. So there are pe people that are figuring it out, but I just kind of feel like when I look at what I can do and what you guys can do as individuals, I feel like, my podcast is my medium. So I just make sure that my stuff is fact checked. I make sure that I give people my sources so that they don't have to trust me so that they can verify everything I say and like build that trust. I can't be on every social media. I can't be on every show or else my show suffers. I tried. Um, I did marketing for one year and it was awful because my, I didn't have time to do my own work. There's so many different ways to communicate now that it can be very, very overwhelming. So I feel like if we all just stay in our, self-prescribed lane and do it well you know hopefully there will be someone who figures out tiktok and we all trust that person and then there's people that are figuring out instagram erica mandy there's also jessica yellen who's doing amazing work on instagram um giving factual news as far as i've been following her for six months and i haven't seen her live me yet um i have my podcast which is a long form thing and it's just i feel like we can't do it all right so, but if each individual who is speaking to the public takes it upon ourselves to just make sure that we're providing facts and we're very careful, we admit our mistakes. I feel like living by example, it's the small step we can take as individuals and as broadcasters, but I don't know how we fix other people. I, I don't know how to get the masses to listen to my show or vote some certain way. So it's, it's I don't really worry about how what I'm doing is being perceived on the other side. As long as I know that my work is something I can be proud of and is based on what, what I think are facts. Um, that's all I can do. And that's all you can do. If we try and solve all of it, um, that's how you get overwhelmed and you quit. Do you ever, do you ever film your podcast or is it just audio? Right now it's just audio. Cause I, I don't even know video is a whole separate beast, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, and I do feel like the COVID experience has made it a little easier because no one's expecting it to be as polished 
as people were expecting even a year ago if you were a video podcaster now you really can go on tv with no makeup and your pjs like no one seems to give a damn so maybe but just the editing is a lot more and it's just a different beast and Mm -hmm. i just don't feel ready for that i guess i don't know the answer is no (laughs) that's nonsense hey hey, it's all good that's why i have rob over here (laughs) because i feel you i feel you 100 percent on i need a producer i need someone who does the rob stuff right now it's still i'm calling all the shots technologically i'm not qualified to be doing anything that i'm doing um that I don't really have the space to try and expand technologically the podcast in any way. So that's a big part of it too. Like I have 5,593 pages to freaking read. So how am I supposed to figure out how to do a YouTube channel? Like, Well, yeah, you're in California, right? Right now I am, yeah. So I wouldn't give out your exact location, but maybe in the near future, you can put it out there, put a feeler out there. Like, hey, if you're in whatever part of California, you know, maybe the team's expanding in the near future if you get enough support. Uh, so there's a problem with that too. That... So this is where I become a problem for Congressional Dish. Um, One of the reasons that I wanted to do this podcast is that I wanted a job that would make me a digital nomad so that I could travel Mm. full time. And so my husband and I decided I would do it first um, and we'd follow his career around. Now he's working full time digitally. And so we're leaving Los Angeles in May and we're going to start traveling full time. So um, I don't really know... Like, I know that there's good people in L.A., although I know a lot of them are leaving now because of all of this crazy COVID stuff and, like, L.A. having absolutely no idea how to handle it. Um, I don't know how to hire right now. Like, it's just not a good time for me to explain You know what you could do? Um, just iPad on the Periscope from the beach. <laughs> just be like, hey, I'm... I'm I mean, oh. Or just go live for an hour on YouTube or wherever. Like, pick your platform of choice. Instagram Live, Facebook Live, Periscope, whatever. And just... All right, guys, we're just going to chit chat about this bill uh, that we I want you guys to look out for. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, and just for an hour, chit chat, look at the comments and from the beach, because <laughs> I'm assuming yeah. uh, where are you guys headed to? Um, well, the first stop will be Seattle. That's where my husband's family is. And we haven't seen them during COVID. So we definitely want to spend like a month up there. And then I don't really know. I am. Um, I have Chargers and Raider season tickets because I'm insane. And so we do want, as soon as those stadiums are open, like I don't care if I get COVID. I want to be there when the Raiders (laughs) stadium opens with all of the crazy people. Like I'm so excited for that. So we'll probably be doing a lot of NFL in the fall. Um, But I also have a lot of like, so a lot of these ideas, like when you talk about like me expanding, which I know would help the show, um, I need someone to help me automate that and I have a really good friend outside of Denver who I would probably go and visit him for a few weeks because he keeps badgering me to do all of these good ideas that you guys have like there's so many people that have great ideas like you can do this to make your show bigger and all it's like I'm saying no to all of it at this moment um but being flexible to move like that I do think it'll make it easier for me to go to all the conferences and do appearances in person and meet other people in the podcasting industry. Like I know that we've met on, you know, you get to turn off the microphone and then have a couple beers, you know? Hell yeah. So I'm excited to be able to do that. This is something we've been working on for a really, really long time. So more of my focus right now, because my show also, my show is it's fine. You know, my audience is small. I've kind of given up the idea that I'm going to solve any of these big picture problems. Like I'm just kind of accepting my own insignificance. So, um, this is really my project right now is just making congressional episodes as good as I can. And I also do have my, my green room, which I've been working on for so many years, but it's a separate private feed just for my producers of the show, the people that pay for the show. Because I do want to do what you suggested and go and just speak for an hour. But internet trolls um, get to me. I don't feel like, even though I know it's the common wisdom in our industry, that we should be everywhere and be out there as much as possible at all times. Like, I don't think that's healthy for me. So I do have this private feed now. And I just did my first episode where all I did was just talk to my producers and I wasn't as careful with my words. I had nothing scripted. I was just like 
I was having trouble with being the producer of a podcast and taking heat from the internet for things that were nobody's business. Um, to be specific, I my grandmother died and I, I took shit because I went to her Zoom funeral and I didn't go to Boston. And I just, I didn't even see it coming. So it's like, here I am mourning my grandmother. I'm not happy that I couldn't be in Boston. And here's some asshole telling me that I'm a, I'm a gullible, you know, person for believing COVID is real and not flying across the country. So um, I expressed that hurt to my core audience. And so that's, I know that it goes against what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be everywhere all the time, but I want a middle ground. I want to be able to speak to my people without inviting in every single person in the world to hear those conversations. And I feel like maybe that's what we kind of need to do too. Like this whole idea that everything should be public. It's been so hard for me to do this show. Like I started this with an audience of one, my dad. Um, and so I started this with just wanting to reach out and talk to people. But once the show got bigger, it's really hard to be speaking to the entire world. And, um, and I think maybe more people who are like me and you guys and want to share things that are true, but don't want to deal with all of the heat. Um, maybe there's a middle ground there that we need to find too, because I'm already loving having a semi-private internet space with people that I know are on my team and understand what I'm doing and will give me the benefit of the doubt if I say something stupid, you know? Um, speaking publicly is a scary thing. And so that's another reason I don't necessarily want to go into YouTube because right now in podcasting, no one can tell me how ugly I look. Like I know my nostrils flare. <laughs> I don't fucking need you to tell me that. So it's, um, <laughs> there's a lot of fear involved in it. It's just... The trolls are real, as we're finding out on (laughs) Jingle Blink social media. Oh, yeah. No, absolutely. Like, I was never known for politics or or none of this stuff. I'm a lifelong Democrat. You know, long story short, um, I decided to vote for Trump this year based on some things that I was seeing. seeing. And uh, I was just talking to my audience via Periscope live. Obviously, it wasn't a green room paywall type of situation where it was like vip it was to everybody so what happened was some kids you know took apart little pieces to make me sound like a jerk (laughs) so they like took out context and and just put up little bitty parts and they were like look smoking gun caught on taped leaked audio uh all that kind of false narrative (laughs) stuff and here we are episode number 22 episode number 22 our first guest our first actual guest on the podcast Oh, yeah. I'm honored. Thanks, guys. Yeah. And you're not hardcore uh, right. So um, people are going to be oh, very, gonna re- love very that. refreshed that we have some balance, you know, because we have Mr. All Right Conspiracy Theorist <laughs> over here. We have Mr. Proud Boy <laughs> Rob over here with the with the alpha beard. Yep. Yep. That's what they like to call me, you know, Mexican American who might look a little Middle Eastern at times, but I'm all right as he gets. But that beard is very transphobic, I will yeah, say. Yeah. People are funny, man. People are hilarious and it's it's a bummer sometimes, but it is what it is. Like you said, you can't, well, earlier we were just talking about this. You can't change everybody's mind. You can't save everybody, even though you think you might be saving them for a, a better cause or whatever. But I do want to kind of segue into how do, how do you, okay, you don't have to answer this question, but... Did you vote right or left? Did, did you vote at all this year? I don't vote right or left, but I never fail to vote. Okay. I well, always vote. So let me reiterate that. Are you okay with saying who you voted for? These oh, days? Sure. Yeah, I voted for Biden. Okay. I felt dirty, but I felt like I, yeah. I like how you had to say you felt dirty, though. So can you explain to the audience yeah. and somebody who, and to two people who didn't vote for Biden, what your philosophy was behind, your thoughts behind voting for Biden versus Trump? So I found the chaos that Trump was inflicting to be unacceptable. I, there has to be some kind of predictability in what the president of the United States is going to do. And so I was just really concerned with his behavior on a lot of different levels. But what really got to me, keeping in mind, like the reason I'm living in Los Angeles right now, I'm living a street away from my sister because her kids haven't been able to go to school. And her kids are ages seven and four. And so the seven-year-old is doing her first year of school on Zoom, which is wicked weird. And the four-year-old needs a ton of attention because she's four, you know? So it's like she can't go to preschool or do any of that stuff. And my sister was like spiraling. She was. And so my husband and I packed up all our stuff and we moved to Los Angeles. And so this whole COVID thing is affecting my life 
in a very real way. Like I can't do the traveling I want to do while my sister is in trouble. And so she's going to, it's getting better, but this whole COVID thing also another factor here is that my dad had a horrible heart attack in 2012. His heart is basically Swiss cheese. And so he is high risk and we want him to be able to see his grandchildren. And so we just made this little pod. This is just my family. We've been pretty much locked down here the entire time, but like we're keeping our family safe so that he can still see the kids and Joe and I are here to help in any way we can. So with that in mind, I looked at this president of the United States not taking the COVID situation seriously and discouraging people from wearing masks and discouraging people from staying apart and hosting rallies indoors, (laughs) you know, like the one that probably killed Herman Cain. Um, So here I am uprooting my life to deal with the situation and the president of the United States who is supposed to be in charge of creating and enforcing the laws and helping the situation wasn't. And so that was really like the unacceptable line for me when it came, like I can't vote for Trump. And the other alternative um, was Biden, who I know to be a warmonger. He voted for Patriot Act, Iraq War. Um, when he was the vice president, he was the the point man on our government midwifing a coup in Ukraine. I'm still pissed about that. Um, but there is a couple of things about Biden that I do like, which is that I know for a fact he cares about the environment. Um, I was very circulation dis- of everything environmental during the Trump years because at at the very least, I feel like we need clean air and clean water. And I don't know anyone who doesn't want that, except for the fossil fuel industries. And so he was tearing up those regulations. Um, and I know that the environment will be cared for better in, under the Biden administration. And so really, when it came to COVID and the environment, the choice became clear to me. And then also the other two parties, um, Libertarian and Green, I didn't know they were candidates this year. Like I knew who Jill, or Jill, not Jill Biden, Jill Stein, and uh, Gary Johnson were in um, in 2016. So I actually voted for Jill Stein, but those two parties didn't really have their candidates out there. So instead of voting, you know, third party, I decided to vote for Biden. Also because I had a hunch that Trump wouldn't leave, and so I did feel like to boost the Biden numbers, being a California voter, where it really didn't matter. I did want those numbers to be overwhelming, just to be like, no, bro, you lost. And it turned out that that fear was justified. So that was my thoughts on it. And um, as I'm sure you guys have dealt with, anytime (laughs) you share these thoughts on the internet, people go bananas (laughs) if they don't agree with how you made your own voting decision. Um, But yeah, that's how I made mine. That's interesting. I don't think that I've had anybody answer that like poignantly about why they voted for Biden. It was just Trump bad. They had no real reasons why to vote. They didn't say anything about the environment. They didn't say anything about anything other than Trump bad. So that at least I can appreciate Mm -hmm. personally. Oh, yeah, because I mean, it's tricky. It's nuanced. And uh, a buddy of mine, he's a stand up comedian, uh, Bryson Brown. He has a joke where he says, we were left with these two guys. It's like the last two dudes to get picked at a pickup game. So it's kind of like, damn it. All right, Joe, come on. You're with us. Like, play defense, man. You know, and and that that was even my thing. I voted for Trump because, in my opinion, he was the lesser of two evils. Yeah. So it's very nuanced. Um, everybody has their perspective. Um, my argument is most of us are low information voters. Yeah. You know, we're, we're not all experts on government. And, and we it's especially these days with the amount of fake news and disinformation and just like propaganda and like QAnon and everyone and their mom has a conspiracy, Rob, um, (laughs) it makes it extremely difficult because it's kind of like, man, it's just so much information. And it's like, well, is he crying Bill Joe or this is a 21st century Joe? And is Trump just a showman and a con man? Or is he actually a populist nationalist that's helping trying to put America first? Is Joe America last? Wait, is this dude a Russian spy? Is this guy a Chinese spy? (laughs) It's like, are they both spies? It's like, where's the P tape? What's going on here? Where's Hunter's thing? And it's like, so much mudslinging and that obviously is the difference between politics and government yeah Um, that's a good point did you did you make anything of that big october surprise or had any thoughts on hunter biden and a lot of this china stuff and ukraine stuff and burisma stuff any of that play a role in any of it 
um, in my decision how to vote, no, no, not at all. Um, but I was fascinated by the way that the tech companies buried that story. Mm, scary. That concerned the hell out. That's of the me. kind of stuff I'm really into. Yeah. Yeah, that bothered me a lot. When I read the actual story, I was like, I uh, don't care. Like, I just don't. I don't yeah, think pictures it's were like, funny. Other than that, like, I don't. Because also, I've been really obsessed with the Ukraine thing since Joe Biden. Um, midwife to coop. So I'm looking at it in that context. And now his son is getting contracts in Ukraine. Like, that's been dirty to me the entire time. Um, so that wasn't really a factor for me just because I already knew it. And so when it became mainstream news, I was like, okay, like, old news, like, Oh, nepotism is a thing. Is that also why Ivanka's in the White House? So it was it didn't it was a non factor for me in that regard. But just the fact that the Democrats, you know, when Trump got impeached the first time, it was over Ukraine, which was fascinating to me. Like he threatened to take the weapons funding away from the government that we had installed. And that was a red line for the Democrats. Um, that was fascinating to me, that whole thing being about Ukraine. Ukraine just keeps coming up. It all started with a coup in 2014 that most Americans aren't even aware that we had a hand in. So, um, yeah, it's... So, speak. You, you've mentioned corporatocracy and also, like, a coup. Have you read um, Confessions of an Economic Hitman? Oh, yeah. That's a good one, ain't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I Rob, you check that one out. No, yet? you keep telling me. And this is something else we're gonna do on the on the on the, the RPT kind of Patreon is read some of these books and kind of discuss them just because they are so fascinating. And there's a lot of good reads like that. But again, along with keeping up what's going on day to day, that's why my goal for 2021. Like I got uh, Red Famine already. You know, to yeah. read about Stalin, read some about this historical stuff that's interesting that we can bring to the podcast that I think will help people. Because how do you feel about like people needing to read a little bit more about the past to quite understand what's going on now and potentially in the future? Wouldn't you agree with that? I do. And it's it's actually kind of a recent revelation for myself. Nice. Um, We're on the same page. Yeah. I I had been completely unaware and didn't care about anything until 2003, which is when I was studying abroad in Germany when we started the Iraq War. And that experience changed my life because I saw the reaction to that war from Europe's eyes and had no idea that it was gonna be different from how it was viewed here. So there, they cared. Like, the debate in the British Parliament was on the TV in the bars that night, you know? Like, everyone was talking about it when they would hear my accent, oh, you're American, let's talk about this. And I was embarrassed that I didn't know anything. So I figured the entire world reacted that way. I came home, that was not the case here. It was just kind of like, oh yeah, we went to war, so? You know, like, it was, it was shocking for me. So that changed my life. From that point forward, I cared about what the Bush administration did. And I, my timeline for history started in 2000. And it's only been recently that I've been starting to really turn back the clock, especially once I realized that like Iraq was not a one-off. Like I didn't realize that we had overturned other governments and I definitely didn't realize that it was dozens and dozens of them. And so once I started looking in that history, I'm like, oh, Iraq is a piece of a pattern. Like, this, this isn't new. This is just a more brazen government overthrow. And so um, by looking backwards, I'm able to understand what I'm seeing in the present to the point that when the Trump administration started doing the weirdest coup I've ever seen by basically saying, like, the president of Venezuela is not the president. This other guy, Juan Guaido, is. It was a very strange coup and it didn't work. Um, but when I saw that in real time, I knew what I was seeing. So by looking at the pattern that has been going on since at least since we overthrew Hawaii. So that was like 1890 something. But like since then, it's been over 100 years. You look at the pattern and I can look at decisions being made right now in conversations happening in Congress right now and see it fit into a pattern. And I wouldn't be able to do that if I didn't know the pattern existed. So, yeah, it's it's key to read about our past. Where are we going next? <laughs> Well, in terms of well, Venezuela is yeah. still on the table. That yeah. was kind of fascinating. So um, I haven't watched the hearing yet, but I've been told by my listeners that our new secretary of state, who is Anthony Blinken, he is he owns this company that basically like tells corporations how to make money around the world. Like he is super corporate. And in his confirmation hearing, he basically said that he's going to 
keep working on this coup in Venezuela that the Trump administration started and like keep going with this Juan Guaido nonsense. Um, so he's on board with that and the Council on Foreign Relations, which is an international body of the people that I think are really pulling the strings like globally. They tweeted out today that, you know, the Venezuelan people need us, just like all of the words that they say when it's like, you've got a target on your back. So mm. Venezuela is still very much in play, even with the new administration. So I'm not taking my eyes off Venezuela. Do you, do you um, like Maduro? Oh, I don't. Here's the thing. All I know is that he is the president. Okay. <laughs> like, I don't I don't know if he's been rigging his elections. I don't know. All I know is that he is the president. Mm. And the legal justification for this one Guaido guy being so basically when they said he rigged the election, they said Juan Guaido as the head of the National Assembly, because there was a vacancy in the presidency, which, first of all, there wasn't. But they used that part of the law to say, okay, this presidency isn't legit. So this guy is in charge. And the Constitution said it was about six months, if I remember correctly. Um, but he gave about six months and he had to be the head of the National Assembly. Well, he's not the head of the National Assembly anymore. And it's been two and a half years at least. So like none of the legal justifications that they used for this in the beginning are legit now. And the people of Venezuela are not are not living by any governmental laws that are being enacted by Juan Guaido. They're still living under Maduro. So whether we like him or not, whether we think his election was legit or not, he is the president of Venezuela. Juan Guaido is not. And so that's all I, those are all the emotions I have about it. I, all I know is what reality is. And we, we're still pushing this alternative one that's just not the case. Any yeah, I don't I don't know a whole lot about it. I just know that the people out there are suffering. That's what I do know. I don't know what Guaido is is uh you know what his stance is on anything. I just see what is it? Are they full out communists now in Venezuela? Or is that just No. Because no, so that's what they're saying. Um That's what the Venezuelans the, are saying. <laughs> right. Is it? <laughs> the people. No. Um so one of the things that we have to keep in mind in Venezuela is that the W. Bush administration tried to overthrow Venezuela. They have a government that doesn't allow the corporations to come in and pillage. So they also have the largest reserves of fossil fuels in the world. So that's why the target is on Venezuela and always has been. So they tax the hell out of any oil that the multinationals come in and take out of their country. And they want those taxes lowered. And so Hugo Chavez was taking a lot of the oil revenue and making that the tax base. And so that's what was paying for their healthcare system. That's what was paying for a lot of the food programs. They were using the fossil fuel money. Maduro was basically handpicked by Hugo Chavez to be the successor and was doing largely the same things. So these multinational corporations, they want to come in there and they want the damn fossil fuels and they want to profit off of it and not share as much with the Venezuelans. That is what Maduro is not allowing to happen. So, what we've been doing is we have declared economic war on Venezuela. We have a blockade. Like, we've even taken their money. So they have money that we've put a hold on because our country, and it's not just us. We have partners in this. We have about 50 other countries that are in on this whole game. But because we control the international means of transferring money, they've taken Venezuela's money, and they're just holding it. And so it's it, for me, it, that feels like stealing. So they keep telling us that Venezuela is mismanaging their money, but they don't have access to their money. They don't have the access to the cash that they need to do the things that a government would do to help the people. So we have to look at the international economic war to understand the suffering of the Venezuelan people. Now, obviously, I'm not saying it's all their fault, um, but if our country was cut off from the rest of the world like that, it would be very, very difficult for us to make our ends meet too. So we just have to keep that in mind, that this is a country that's been under economic attack for a very, very long time. And that's going to be hard to govern. Is it embargoes or how are they doing the economic hit? So that's a part of it. There's embargoes. Again, like I said, they're stealing their money. Um, there's sanctions. I mean, sanctions are economic warfare. So it's just a combination of a lot of things. That is, it's making it very hard. Speaking for, of uh, for the Venezuelan government spe function. Speaking of sanctions and, and economic war and tariffs and all that, uh, what's your take on the trade war with China? 
Well, China's a fascinating one to me because so they were welcomed into the World Trade Organization, which like from what I've learned, kind of like the big picture of what our game is in the world, they're trying to create a global government. And I know that sounds very Alex Jones. I got the yeah. documents. They're doing know, it. Right? The globalists. <laughs> yeah. The globalists are turning the frogs gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I know how that phrase sounds, but we have the organizations, we know the names, United Nations, World Trade Organization, International Monetary Fund, and World Bank. And they've been very open since the end of World War II that they want to have an economic system that is based out of those organizations that is global, with the idea being that if the entire world is economically integrated, then we would not be incentivized to fight each other. So it's their way of not having war anymore, even though to get it implemented, there have been so many wars. So I think the idea falls apart on its face, but essentially the World Trade Organization is supposed to be the economic hub of the world. It's supposed to be all the rules that everyone follows. And China was allowed in there in 1993 with the idea being, okay, China's in here now, they're going to open up their markets and they're going to allow the multinationals in. They're going to let the banks come and, you know, siphon interest out of their population. They're going to let the um, the mining companies come in there and take all their minerals and like basically open up their land the way our land has been poured out to the world for so long. So China gets into the WTO, but then this relatively new guy has been not following the rules. Instead, they have like a hybrid system. So it's not, it's definitely not communist because obviously we have companies that are in there. We've outsourced so much of our labor force to China because we've now allowed the multinationals to labor shop. That's what they want to do. They don't want to pay us 15 bucks an hour plus benefits. They want to pay 50 cents an hour, no benefits. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they've been allowed to do in China. And so the companies are doing that, but then China's not allowing them in to profit. And so they're, they're doing this like hybrid model and Russia is partnering with them too. Like they're not following the WTO rules. They're doing something outside of it. So that's why they're enemy number one. But at the same time, there are economic partners because again, so many of so-called US companies, they're not US companies, they're multinationals. They have no loyalty to us whatsoever. But these companies that we operate on behalf of, they have their operations in China. So we can't go balls out anti-China and like declare war on them because the multinationals would lose their their laborers and their fact their laborers and their factories and all of that stuff. So China is an interesting one to watch. Um, and so when I think about the trade wars, I think you had Donald Trump in charge who is not on board with this whole system. And so he was making decisions from an uninformed place. Like I don't know that he really thought through um, anything that he was doing. I just know that he's like anti-China, but Joe Biden is Pro China. on board with the whole <laughs> WTO game. Yeah, like he is, that's one of the reasons that he helped overthrow Ukraine, Ukraine because the fossil fuel companies wanted it to, it's a hub for fossil fuels that go from Russia to Europe. It also has amazing agricultural um, wealth because they have fertile land. And so Joe Biden's on board with this whole game. So this whole idea that Joe Biden is going to be a Chinese puppet is hilarious to me because what I see in the global game is that now the empire is back. The U.S. military is going to go back to, you know, being the muscle to make sure that these trade routes are safe and overthrowing countries that aren't willingly joining this international system. And I think it's going to be China's not going to love the Biden administration because I mean, I don't know. I can't predict the future. All I know is that Biden has the the reasoning to want China to behave differently, to assimilate into this system. Now, maybe Biden will try what has been tried a lot in the, the past, which is like incentives to join the system. Maybe it won't be so adversarial, but the goals are going to be different. Trump was just mad at China, where Biden's going to try and get China either in the system or to stop screwing with it. Um, but that's the big game that I'm watching. And the trade war, it's just going to be different just because the goals are going to be different. So does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. It makes I feel sense. like I did a bad job. It makes sense. That. And and it makes sense. And um, the way that we're moving troops into Syria, 
I, my mm-hmm. theory, I don't know too much about that, but what came to mind was, okay, I know they're setting up a pipeline over there through yep. Qatar, Syria, and Turkey, and maybe that's why the troops need to be there, because it's like, hey, we're going to be constructing, and uh, we don't want no radicals over here, insurgents, right. Right. trying to do a little insurrection on the side of this road. So uh, we need some troops out there. So, you know, that's why it makes me uneasy, and that's why I like to, like, uh, troll my my fans, you know, the Biden supporters are all just like oh look we're sending troops to syria you know like you said the empire's back we're back to back to the original program yeah and it's funny that you bring up syria because that syria was the reason i couldn't vote for hillary clinton in 2016 because she was promising to overthrow syria and like just remember where we were at the end of 2016 we had planes and russian planes that were flying over syria as we were trying to get rid of assad and i have it was an episode i called regime change in 2014 where there were witness after witness in Congress in these hearings that no one was attending, where they were saying, like, we are trying to overthrow the government of Syria. They kept using the word regime change. It was very clear what they were trying to do. And so I was convinced that if Hillary became president, she had already said that they were going to do no fly zones over Syria. Well, if Russia is flying over Syria and we're doing a no fly zone, that means we have to shoot down Russian planes, which sounds a lot like World War III to me. Mm -hmm. So that's why I didn't want her in charge. And so the idea that we've now gone from Trump to Biden, who in my opinion is just Hillary with a dick, I'm super concerned (laughs) that we now see Syria back uh, on the table. You guys just got the green room treatment. Yeah, for uh, real. Because Jen nor- normally will put a... <laughs> yup, yup. I just thought about that, That would have been bleeped. But, you know, we got the exclusive right here. That's Red so Pilt the mileage. funny. <laughs> Dude, so did you... Wait, who'd you vote for in 16? Independent? Oh, that's right. That's right. You said that. Okay. I was about to say, wait, did you vote for Trump in 16? Okay, let's just say that you only had between those two parties. You could only vote for Hillary or Trump. What would you have done? Answer honestly. Wow, I hate that. Question. Yeah, I bet you do. It's a tough questions here at RP- RPT. Um, dun, 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 well, dun. if we were really going back to 2016 and we didn't know then what we know now, I probably would have voted for Trump just because there was a chance that he would have been more peaceful and there was a chance that he would have been a different person. I mean, I watched The Apprentice too, so <laughs> none of the narcissism, like none of that surprised me. I've kind of felt like I knew the guy better than most because I watched trashy TV. Um, but again, it was a TV show. Like maybe he's not that bad. Maybe he's smarter than we think. So I probably would have done that just because Hillary was damn near promising World War Three to the world. And she was promising it to the like the Council on Foreign Relations, like that was the speech that I kept playing in my show back then. She was promising the world leaders that and saying different things to us, which also really pissed me off. So, um, yeah, I probably would have voted Trump. But, uh, mm. Mm, sleep with that one tonight. Come to that realization. I, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. you got any, I got some questions that Chingo sent me over from uh, the, the podcast page. Do you have anything else before I get some of these questions, Chingo? Oh uh, no! Go ahead. And All right, let me uh, uh, let me pull this up. You're gonna get me in so much trouble. Back yeah, then. you're gonna be in so. <laughs> I, I'm so glad you don't use Instagram actually, because people are gonna come after you. I'm just kidding. No, I think yeah. I think a lot of folks are gonna feel like this was refreshing. It's not just Rob and I, you know, like <laughs> like dude, what's up with Biden? You know, we're only how many days in? Like six we're only, or we're seven? only a week in, and he's already pissed off unions. He's I mean, th- that is true though. He's people. He's hated by half the country, so there's plenty of stuff to talk about that we could have a conversation about, right? Like, it's not false. We're not talking about complete, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, alien people yeah, or so lizard I, people. Yeah, I think people are going to enjoy this episode because it's not just <laughs> Rob and Chingo trying to... I like how you've been throwing me under the bus here. I have the conspiracies and I have the, the fucking alt-right hey, thoughts here. Hey, man, this is politics, bro. It's dirty. Some, it's like House of Cards. Jeez, over here. throw me under the bus like fucking Mr. Wonderful on Shark Tank. Um, all right, Jen. Is DC a corporation owned by London and other entities? London? That's random. Answer the tough questions, ma'am. I don't know. These are just questions for you. Damn. Um, <laughs> it's like conspiracy questions? Is it owned by corporations? Yes. I mean, right now it is. That's the thing. I don't think this is a systemic thing. I think it's a, we have elected 535 people to the lawmaking branch of our government, and the majority of them are corporate servants. So I'm going to say yes, but I don't think it has to be that way. It's not systemic. So I'm not going to say DC is that way, Mm -hmm. but this current Congress is, yes. All right. In your opinion, what kind of threat does the Second Amendment have over the next four years? 
I don't know. I don't think it's a threat. You don't have to think of no, no threats to the Second Amendment? What about first? But I'm far more concerned about the First Amendment than I am about the second. Well, we only have right the second now. in case the first, you know, does it work? What is it? What's the phrase? We only have the Second Amendment in case the First Amendment goes away. Uh, or some shit like that. Or you have the I don't second. see anything. Like, no, there's never going to be a... The Second Amendment says that we have a right to bear arms, and it was written at the time of muskets. So I think that we're always going to have the ability to have a musket. Now, are we always going to have the ability to have a 30-round magazine that can be easily replaced and shoot up a bunch of people in a nightclub? I hope not. Um, but I also don't see anything in Congress where they're moving on that issue at all. So until we have our next mass shooting, mm. I don't think it's an issue. It's like off the radar at the moment. Well, I'm sure so. Beto O'Rourke is ready and waiting yeah. for the crisis to happen. Hell yeah, we'll take your assault rifles. Hey, man, why would you run on that in Texas? Well, I think Biden said it too. Biden was like, we, we're coming for your AR-15. He did say that, yeah. There's yeah. clips of that. I don't, I don't know. It's just a weird thing to say. It's just like, okay, for instance, this is off the questions real quick, but I will not ban fracking. Joe Biden will not ban fracking. First day. Read yeah. my lips, said Kamala. Yeah. He so. will not ban fracking. Well, it's different. It's not a ban if you're just saying on federal land, this is not something we're going to do anymore. And keep in mind, one of the reasons I voted for him was because Environment. of environmental issues. I am very concerned with the lack of regulation around the water used in fracking because it's getting into drinking water. It is friggin' poison. It's also getting into the soil because we don't know that those pools that they keep the poison water in are not, not leaking. And for four years, the enforcement branch of our government has been tro controlled by people that are basically foxes in the hen houses. So I, when it comes to the environment, he is keeping his promise on the land that is owned by the people. He didn't, however, say like fracking is no longer allowed on private land. So it's like if you own a bunch of land and you want to risk your water, that is still allowed. That's not a ban. It is different. We're going to talk some energy experts on RPT. Don't you worry, listeners. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Can we actually unite these two parties? Um, they're already united. To where, to where the people, to they're where the people, to, I guess to, what they're saying is to where the people feel like the country isn't divided. But I guess that kind of goes into social issues, though. That's really a lot of social thoughts and theories going around about... I think the division is bullshit. And I think this conversation is a perfect example of that. Like, I, I agree. I am a... Yeah, it's like when we have these conversations amongst ourselves, we're not that divided. We generally want the same things. Like we might have disagreements on issues, but it doesn't have to get into the screaming place. It almost never does with me. Um, the division is something we're being sold to. We're being sold by... Uh, corporate media because it, it benefits them like red versus blue is horse shit especially when you look at war they're all down with wars like the democrats and republicans came together real quick to overdo the to um override the veto of the war authorization there was no problem doing that so it's like on certain issues there is no sunlight between those two parties where there is some difference is in like labor rights, um, environmental stuff. Like I said, like there are some issues where they're different, but in the halls of power, they agree on a lot, especially when it comes to allowing corporations to profit as much as possible, no matter who gets hurt in the process. Like they're united in that. Where again, I think the real divisions in this com in this country are between corporate power, monopoly powers, and the rest of us. And they don't want us to see that division because we outnumber them by a lot on the side of workers and people that want clean water and, and don't necessarily want to be sending our friends and our neighbors overseas to fight so that a trade route can be protected between like Thailand and, and China. Like we don't care, you know, what the, the multinationals are able to do. And yet we are the muscle for this international system that they are setting up. And we were never consulted in this. We being like the vast majority of Americans who don't even understand that it's going on. So I feel like we're being lied to about the division. I don't think it's real. So, yeah. Is, <laughs> can we is, unite the country? Fuck yeah, we can. Yeah, I'm still waiting on my stimmy. So um, is it true that... Yeah, where is that, by the way? <laughs> whatever happened to the stimmy? Uh, is it true that Congress has a low approval rating? Like record low, I heard. I don't know if it's... If yeah. Can, fact check yeah. <laughs> let me pull it up and real it's, quick. it's fascinating because we just keep they keep documenting this phenomenon where people are disgusted with what congress does as a whole 
but they keep reelecting their own member of Congress. And I have documented this myself. It's over 90 percent in both the House and the Senate. The incumbents win every time. It's bananas. And I think a big reason for that is that we just aren't aware of who our congressmen are. We don't know what they do. We don't know how they vote. We don't know what's going on. So it's like, how can you judge their job performance if you don't know, like, oh, just go check out their voting records. Well, if you don't know what they're voting on and what's in those bills, like how are we supposed to do our job? So because the media is Mm -hmm. doing such a terrible job of informing us about what's happening in that branch, we're not holding our representatives accountable because how can we? Yeah, right now the media... Right now, the media is uh, oh. letting us know um, Joe Biden's favorite ice cream flavor. Mm, yes. Um, we, we know that he has a cat <laughs> that mm-hmm. they're going to tell us a lot about. Yep, the Pel- the mm-hmm. Peloton bike. Yeah. Um, Kamala's style sense, her fashion sense. Chucks and pearls, yeah. Yeah. So that's, I agree that the, the journalists are not really on the job. And it was a great point that people say, hold them accountable. See, check their voting record. It's not about red or blue. Check their voting record. You know, and it's like, I don't know what the hell's in this thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, how many pages is it? And I don't, these are dingleberries and I'm new to all this pork and uh, dingleberries. Well, so uh, before we got in here, uh, the last tweet I read by somebody was just talking about travel bans and stuff again. Was that today, Jen? Did you keep up with that? Like there's new travel bans and yeah. including South, you know, Africa. South Africa. and other, But but it's just being reported differently. And I know a lot of people, myself, you know, just regular people are like, why does it seem like it was the end of the world when Trump was talking about this stuff? But now it's just like, oh, no, it's cool. Yeah, he's got yeah, it all, we, t- it's we all under to. control, you know? We have to. You know, Biden's doing what he has to do. It's not xenophobic. It's not terrible. It's not like we're going to scare you with this news. It's like, here's the news. First, it was like, that's racist and xenophobic. Yeah. It's just, do you, do you, do you see the frustration in something like a headline like that? I see a frustration in all of the headlines about COVID right now because we don't know what's going on. We yeah. don't know who to trust. We don't know what's real. We don't know. Preach. I feel like we just haven't been given the information that we need to decide for ourselves what, po- like, how do we determine if a policy is necessary if we don't really understand how contagious the virus is, if we don't really know how many of us have it. Um, I do blame positives. the Trump administration for a lot of this because where, where I was getting hopeful back in the summer was we have the technology for these rapid tests. I mean, you guys are JRE fans. Mm-hmm. Like you go into Stubbs to see their shows. Everyone in the audience gets tested. How is it that Joe and Chappelle are able to do this, but the schools can't? Mm-hmm. And so, and I am excited. Like I'm reading the, the COVID relief law that was just signed or dingle buried in the law. And there is an enormous amount of money for that testing and contact tracing. And I do feel like there's strategies that make sense regardless of Mm -hmm. how how, um, virulent the virus is. Like if you have a room full of people or a stadium full of people and you've tested every single one of them and the virus isn't in there, then we don't need masks, do we? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I feel like the policies are there that would make sense, but there's been no national leadership. And like you guys said, it's been a week. So I'm going to give the new guy a couple months to hopefully put in place the things that have worked in like South Korea, for instance, or, and I know it's a much smaller country, but like New Zealand, they've been living life completely normal now for like nine months. Yeah. They have so, like two farms and two sheep though. We really can't compare them to America. Though. They're an Island. Well, what? but here's the thing. Like they, um, they enforce their quarantines. So it's not necessarily that we have to shut down international travel, but we would have to enforce, like if you come in here, you stay in your hotel room for 14 days. The Asian countries are doing that by like, you basically have to wear a monitor and they deliver you food to your room. It's funded by taxes. Um, they have, there are solutions to these problems. Let me and, well, go ahead, go ahead, well, you go first. Well, well, real quick, I want to highlight two things that you said. Um, Number one, I want to take this opportunity to agree with you about rapid testing. That is something that, uh, brace yourself, listeners of the RPT. I'm upset a lot of y'all. Trump and Pence and whoever they had on this COVID team kind of dropped the ball on the rapid testing stuff. Like that was that was a thing that a lot of smart people smarter than me above my pay grade were like, it's the rapid testing. Like, look into this cheap, affordable, quick, easy uh, type of thing. So. Trump, I'm going to take away a point. Uh, You're getting one less brownie point from me. (laughs) And number two, before I forget, earlier you mentioned you were studying abroad in Germany and you got to experience how propaganda varies from the perspective of the citizens of different countries. So that's something to 
that's again that's one of the things that really grinds my gears is the persuasion that happens in, in mass media and what i try to preach to people is that we don't get the same propaganda news that other countries do so always keep that in mind you know a venezuelan taxi driver might tell me like nah bro it's because this is and that it's like well he, He's getting it from his pr- perspective. Yeah, but anyway, you were. Uh... I well, that good points. Uh, we're gonna tr- take that off the board over here. I'm gonna erase Trump's point over here. Mm-hmm. Um, when you look at California and you look at states like Florida, and you see how open Florida is and how close California is, does that not make you think a little bit that like again? And we already all said it that we don't know. Like the science you can't just say science and shut things down. You can't just do things without rhyme or reason. But Florida is more of a. California is very central. Like you're doing with this, what people are calling, uh, what do we call them, gruesome newsome versus DeSantis over there in Florida, and they have less deaths, less hospitalizations, less ICU visits. Does, isn't that some, like? What are your thoughts basically on that? Well, I think for Canada, that's not true. I was reading today California that it is, but we will relook at it after this episode. Yeah, I'm not sure. Like I said, I don't know that that's true. But I can also tell you, as someone who's living in LA County, the idea that we've been shut down is a lot we haven't been um but our rules have made no sense so what you're hearing in the rest of the country which is accurate is that they shut down outdoor dining around thanksgiving and they did um but we have not been shut down i can go into just about any store and have been this entire time and get in and go shopping so it's like they, they never shut down all of the indoor stuff they allowed christmas to happen they allowed all the indoor stuff to continue so those of us that are living here are like wait 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 so you're telling us that sitting outside on an empty patio isn't allowed, but I can go into the Apple store with 50 other people. Cause they also said like, oh, well you can go in there, but the capacity has to be a lot less. It's not what I witnessed. We had full parking lots. There was no one enforcing this. And so if you have no one enforcing how many people are inside these stores, the malls are full. So the idea that we were completely shut down, we had this whole draconian thing, it's a lie. And so when you look at our numbers that they spiked in the fall, like. Yeah, because we really weren't shut down the entire time. Now, our schools haven't been open. Outdoor dining was closed. Like We we closed down more than Florida, but just want to put it out there that we're not as closed well, as we've I, been told. I know the comedy clubs. <laughs> yeah, what about comedy, comedy clubs, yeah. gyms, churches, salons? Because well, well, I tour comedy, and um, I think they're at 25% maybe. No, they're not even open. Like The comedy oh. store has a pretty, it's not huge, but it's a big enough parking lot. And so they were saying like you can have someone performing back there for the parking lot have everybody sit outside the stores don't want to do this forever they won't allow it there's also like the original room has a window that goes directly out into the bar like the patio area they won't allow anyone there either so it's like the rules have made no sense and then the cherry on top of it is that down here in southern california our icu capacity is still at zero percent and yesterday gavin newsom just lifted all of the restrictions it's because like did, all of it, it's coming back now it's because like, there's a uh, they have 1.5 million signatures on, on the, the recall newsom yeah yeah and also and it's like if this is legit scientific like who cares about the recall but what i'm asking now it's like okay if it was safe if it's safe now that we have zero percent icu capacity why has our restaurant is, industry been decimated for the last two mm-hmm. and a half months like i don't i don't understand why is it okay now so there's actually people like me that were kind of okay like you know newsom has been doing his best not well um i've given him the benefit of the doubt yesterday pissed me off because it means that everything that we've been doing was not based on science because this decision we're still at zero well, well so. people people in cali started demanding to see the science like what's the algorithm what's the equation so that we can know what the goalposts are in other words yeah. you know in case it's like well you know you got to just stop the spread and then we got to get this number to this point this number to that point they just simply told the public it's too complex and we don't want it just it's better that y'all don't see it just listen well, to us and do as we say numbers that we could measure and the one that made sense to me the entire time was the icu bed capacity that one always made sense to me it was something you could count it was how many beds do we have left for people that have heart attacks and car accidents? Like if we have zero beds, we have a problem. So that was a number that we were always willing to play by. We're still at zero. So like, how are you lifting it now? Like that's, it's just the idea that I, I think has become crystal clear for us now that they're making up the rules as they go and they're completely disconnected from anything scientific. Like that's what's infuriating. Oh yeah, I bet I bet people are pissed. So what what's the vibe from... I guess other Californians are they 
Is it unanimous? Like they're pissed at Newsom? I don't know. I haven't left my house in nine friggin' oh, months. Man. <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Jeez, man. She's come to Texas already and call it a day. Well, then, like I said, I'm here for my family. Like in Seattle. Yeah. Right? Seattle's the next. Yeah, we stop. made a deal back in the beginning of this that who's ever. Whoever wanted to live by the strictest rules, those are the rules that we've lived by. And honestly, like, even though we're living in far stricter conditions in my pod than I feel is necessary, my family has not fought at all. So it was the right way to play this. Like, we're, we're doing it right. But, like, I'm very bored. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm doing a lot of hiking. Um, but, yeah, I, I haven't been able to go out and see anyone or do anything because of all this. Mm. which is why i want it over too oh it's yeah like if it's gonna take two more weeks of this to really get our icus back like okay fine like if it took getting to 10 percent, if that's gonna take another month but that's where we are and that's what they told us like okay like we were what's crazy about the announcement being made yesterday out of nowhere like that is that we were all just kind of chilling at this point like we were accepting what the reality was we were waiting for the icus it was starting to look good if you're paying attention to the numbers I really wasn't all that upset about it. I was just waiting for us to get to that point. We were getting there. What I'm afraid of now as someone who is living under these strict rules of my family is, is our, is this reopening just going to put us back to where we were? Are we going to stay at zero I or zero percent ICU now? Is this going to go on even longer because of these decisions? It's like, if you're making these decisions to stop the spread, stop the freaking spread. So is I, it, is it back open? Is it wide open now or what's the new so rule? Ventura County, which is pretty close to me, they reopened everything immediately. So um, outdoor dining's open again. Gyms are open like immediately. LA County is waiting until Friday. So that's what, three days from now? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're, they, they left it up to the counties to decide what they're going to do. And all the counties are like, Woo! <laughs> time to reopen. And it's not like it matters because this entire time LA County has been, has more strict rules than Orange County. And so if you really wanted to go outdoor dining or like if your kids wanted to go to school, you just go to Orange County. Like I have friends in Orange County whose kids have been in school the entire time. Like I don't understand it. Does the virus not spread in pri private schools, but it does spread in public? Um, it's that type of stuff where. Yeah, yeah it gets real weird. Like, you have to consider like, okay, Democrat run city, teachers unions, you know, Orange County, they're very like Republican, yeah. if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah they are. Uh, dude, we're taking an hour and a half of your time. I, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Wow, that flew. That that's because that's how fun we are here. Yeah. We, we, we got you to cuss as well. Yeah. Oh, that's not hard. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the goal for a congressional dish here coming up in this first quarter of 2021? Well, I have a lot of legislation to read and find all the juicy stories. So I'm working on the 5,593 Corona bus, which is what we're smash all the government funding together. That's called an omnibus bill. And so it had Corona in it. So Corona bus, I love that name. Um, and then there's also the defense authorization. They authorized a year's worth of wars. It was about 4,000 pages. And I want to know what the hell they authorized because I'm actually more concerned about the Biden administration when it comes to war as I was, than I was during the Trump administration, even though I read this thing every year. Um, so yeah, I have a lot <laughs> on my plate. Um, but those episodes are always really good because they always sneak crazy stuff in the law. So at least we'll know what that is. And so then, where can listeners get all that information and uh, follow you in the show? So Congressional Dish is everywhere that you can find podcasts. If you want access to The Green Room, which um, I love The Green Room, but kind of stuff that I put back there, like if I watch a hearing, sometimes I'll watch it with my husband or with a friend so you can kind of hear like the commentary that happens as I'm making the, the sound clips. I talk a lot of shit when I'm just like watching it by myself. That goes in The Green Room. There's also, um, you know, when I'm just talking to producers, that can be found on my Patreon. Um, my, my show is funded with just by anyone providing whatever they consider fair to the as show. As long as it ain't zero. <laughs> exactly. As long as it's not zero, that's fair to me. And so anyone that contributes automatically gets the green room on Patreon. So that's um, easy. But yeah, anywhere podcasts are found. And then my show notes are on congressionaldish.com because I expect no one to trust me. And so I give you all my sources, sound clips, all of it. So you can check it out for yourself in context. Sweet. 
Well, think. Keep yeah. up the great work because we need more people like you that can um, make it make this subject matter more accessible and and just fun, you know, to where you take the time, you go through it, you parse it out and you translate it <laughs> for the layman's. So thank you for what you do. Yeah, Jen. Thanks well, for your time, thank man. Thank you.